Hey guys, this is Caspi with Tape, and today you join me for episode 3 of Project Luna in Real Solar System. And uh, yes, we are here in the VAB taking a look at the first vehicle. And uh, just before we start, I'd like to say that everyone's been asking about the mods. Um, apparently people do want a mod list. Apparently my instructions were not clear enough. Um, I will leave a full mod list in the description. It will be very long, and what I suggest you do is you get CCAN and you install it. Um, and Scott Manley actually has a really good video on this. If you haven't used CCAN, it can be a little confusing. But Scott Manley actually does have a video on installing real solar system with CCAN. So I'll link that as well and you can just follow his tutorial because there's no point in me making one when his is just going to be better. So yeah, but there will be a full list of the mods so you can get my exact install if you so desire. Uh, it only takes three episodes of badgering to get me to do what you want. Anyway, so yes, the first vehicle, LF1. Lunar Flyby 1, that's what this is. It's going to fly by and maybe orbit the moon if it has enough delta V. And uh, yeah, so it's going to be our first Mooner, Lunar, Lunar vehicle, not Mooner, that's that's normal Kerbal Space Program. Um, and yeah, so the probe is in the fairing, it launches aboard the Taurus 2 vehicle, which comes from the first episode, uh, where we tried to put, where it tried to put some satellites in our geosynchronous orbit. It failed, but um, we but we fixed the problem that caused it to fail. Um, so yeah, it's the exact same vehicle, if you want to know some details about this, you can go watch the first episode if you haven't already. But the only change we've made to it is the second stage now has three ignitions, apparently not, um, but it should. So if we changed it to this... Three ignitions! There we go. So the problem in the first episode was it only had one ignition, so... Um, it could only be ignited once, obviously, which means it couldn't circularize the orbit at the top of its orbit, so it was just left its probes in a really elliptical orbit. But now we have three ignitions, it should be able to, the second stage should be able to get itself into orbit, do the burn to the moon, and potentially do a tweak. So hopefully this will work, um, now that it has enough ignitions. But yes, the rest of the rocket is exactly the same. The probe is in the fairing, and it's a very tiny probe on our biggest rocket. Yes, it looks a bit ridiculous, but uh, we're sending it to the moon. I don't know how much delta V that takes. I mean, I could have checked, but <laughs> I don't plan things. <laughs> anyway, yes, this is LF1, the probe itself. Let's just talk about it from top to bottom. Um, so it has a parabolic antenna, just this cool looking shielded one. I love how these, these kind of, some of these, I guess maybe it's for atmospheric entry? Why do they shield antennas like this? I don't know, but it looks cool. Anyway, this has like a three gigameter range, so it should be absolutely fine for the moon, but I was taking no chances. And yeah, and then below it we have a communic Communicatron 32, which is good because it's kind of omnidirectional. It's just generally useful. And there's a reaction wheel for obviously, um, tran not translating, for rotating uh, easily. Has a bunch of scientific equipment. The uh, uh, gravioli detectors and um, temperature uh, the thermometers look really cool in this. They're just like metal boxes, unlike in the normal game. It also has this little camera um, so that we can see the dark side of the moon as the first, not the first, but one of the first moon to fly by, lunar flyby probes did in real life. And it has a mini goo radiom ra radiometer, 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 that's the word, okay. Um, and yeah, so there's a little bit of science just kind of for funs, for shits and giggles. There's no, we're not doing a career mode, so it doesn't matter too much. Um, but yes, then below is the propulsion system. It's a hydrazine powered uh, stage that uses two 0.5 kilonewton radial thrusters and um, all of these tanks are service module tanks and are highly pressurized so these should work hopefully. Um, because we've had problems with these thrusters in the past, but they're actually really useful. And then it just has a couple of solar panels, a couple of little solar panels here, which hopefully should provide enough power. And yes, that is LF1. So let's go and see this fly right now. So here we are on the launch pad in, I believe, Brazil, I think, because it's far more equatorial than Florida. And it seemed like a good place to launch out of to get to the moon, because it means we can more easily line up with the moon on our launch. So we're actually going to take a... Uh, 45 degree angle on our launch so that we try to get our inclination as close to the moon as possible so that we don't have to do that in orbit and waste fuel. Um, so we're just going up now on the Taurus 2. Um, quite a big rocket, as I've said before. Uh, it's because it has very uh, not very dense fuel, so it looks massive. The payload will <laughs> look actually a little bit stupid on top of it. Um, but yeah, uh, launch is going pretty well. Fairly steep. I'm, I'm still having a little trouble getting my... Uh, my launch trajectory is to be, you know, flat enough. I always kind of turn over fully too late, I think. But uh, it always seems to work out about right. I'm probably just being a little inefficient, really. 
But it's a sandbox save, so it doesn't really matter if my rockets are a little too big. Um, although, well, maybe when I build the moon rocket I'll want to be as efficient as possible, otherwise the moon rocket will have to be massive. But really it's actually okay. Um, and yeah, the rockets seem to be working out. We decouple the uh, first stage there, fire up the second stage, now with three ignitions. I think I do waste one at some point, I think I just accidentally hit Z and it just wastes an uh, ignition, which was... It's fairly stupid of me. Um, you can also see I've kind of uh, moved a little away from 45 degrees, because that was a little steep to uh, get to the moon. I maybe should have checked the moon's actually actual inclination, but I guess I just sort of didn't, because, I don't know, it, didn't re it just didn't occur to me, actually. Anyway, so now I'm pointing down a little bit so that I don't have to reignite the engine to get into orbit. Um, if we can do this all in one burn, it'll save us an ignition, and that'll allow us to use the uh, stage to get to the moon. Um, anyway. So yeah, we are actually in orbit now, um, and now it's time to plan our trajectory to the moon. Uh, yes, going to the moon for the first time, uh, and it, we've got ourselves an encounter right there. We'll tweak it a little bit later to, um, well, get closer to the moon, and now it's time to go. You'll see me just spinning the tank here. This is because of eulage. Um, basically, all of the fuel in zero-g will just kind of float around and not be together, but if you spin up the tank like this, it'll... Um, uh, it'll uh, the centripetal force will force all the fuel together and allow it to be forced into the engine like that, meaning that the engine is the engine is in a stable configuration because all of the fuel is stable. Um, yeah, that's modeled in real solar system, which is really cool. Anyway, we've got our burn fairly quickly. This is, of course, at four times time accelerate, but it was quick nonetheless. Um, I have used all the ignitions out of that now, though, because uh, I accidentally used one, as I said. Um, so I won't actually be able to use the second stage to adjust my orbit so we're just onto the service module of the probe now to get us into uh, a flyby and potentially an orbit of the moon we actually probably do have enough delta v so now we're going to fly out on uh, fly over there however it turns out obviously these two tiny solar panels don't generate a ton of electricity and um well, I actually just don't have enough power, and I'm going to run out of power before I even get to my maneuver node, which means I'm going to have to do my burn early. However, again, <laughs> so again, however, um, the fuel has become unstable in these uh, thrusters, and I thought that wouldn't be a problem because I was using highly pressurized tanks. Uh, I tried to spin it up anyway, but that doesn't work. Um, so it turns out, which I didn't know at this point, is to induce eulage in a highly pressurized tank, you actually do need a thruster, or actually if you just flip it end over end instead of spinning it, it would work much better. I just didn't know that at the time, so I couldn't use the engines. We do, however, however fly past the moon, um, spinning still, I have persistent rotation mod. Um, so we do, we do fly past the moon. The mission is a success, we just don't get really close to the moon because um, of my misunderstanding of how eulage works. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, kind of a success, mostly successful, you know, I'm going to call it a win. Anyway, we will have to launch another one of those missions, but for now, we need to continue work on our manned space program. So, we're testing a new uh, capsule with a new abort system. This is a two-man capsule. Oh my god, you can put two people in space. Yes, you can, but we don't want them to die. So, we're going to test the abort system uh, right now. So, we fire up the abort system. It doesn't quite work in straight away, but then does get us away from the vehicle, and we are safe. But I wasn't really happy with that, because it kind of, we were stuck to the vehicle for a while. While and it also took off the probe, so it just smashes into the ground. No Kerbal in it, so there's no problem, but still, that wasn't a very clean abort. So, I'm gonna try again with my own abort system. This is actually a lot like the abort system on the, uh, the single manned missions from last episode, but it is a little sleeker and just better. It worked better. I'll explain that in the VAB later. Um, but yes, yeah, so when we get up to about two kilometers, I uh, eject from the boost, and hopefully we will be safe. So, we hit the abort button, and that's actually a very clean escape. I was very happy with that, and uh, yeah, that went pretty well. And then hopefully this will land now that the probe hasn't been ripped off, and uh, it does. But anyway, let's go and take a look at the vehicle that will be hoisting this into space. So yes, we're back in the VAB, taking a look at the Pegasus 1. You will have just seen the testing of the abort system, which is just this. It's pretty much exactly the same as the abort system on the Phoenix missions, which were our single Kerbal crewed launches from last episode. But this is now a double Kerbal launch, 
Um, no real point to taking two Kerbals, but I thought might as well up the vehicles. Uh, but the main pro the uh, main thing we're trying to do with the Pegasus missions is docking. Well, I'm just going to see, you know, what kind of Delta V it takes to dock around Kerbin. Um, you know, see if it's see if it's possible. Can we dock and get? Behind? It's a fairly trivial thing, but hey, might as well get some practice in because I think I will be doing a mission with docking when we land on the moon, kind of Apollo style, probably. So anyway, yes, let's talk through this vehicle, the Pegasus One. It starts with the launch vehicle, which doesn't actually have a name. I think it's just currently called Pegasus One, the launch vehicle. So yes, the engines. Uh, these are the Viking Five Bs. They are used on the Ariane Five in real life. Uh, each of them provides 720 kilonewtons of thrust, so we. Have have quite a lot of thrust to weight ratio off the pad um, and the reason we have three is so that we have total roll control because if we're docking with another spacecraft we're going to need really good control on ascent and if you only have one engine you can't roll and of course I could bring Verna thrusters but um, there was no real engine that matched up with the Verna thrusters very well for this vehicle so I just went with three gimbling engines to do that their gimbal limit has been cut down a bit because engines tend to gimbal quite a lot in this uh, in realism overhaul um, and they're burning UH25 and NTO, which I guess is... I literally don't know. Maybe something with, to do with nitrogen. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's the first stage, uh, and yeah. Um, so the second stage, uh, if we can get a look at it. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, in the VAB, you can see that often these things don't actually like go to the top. The, it's super jank and broken. I don't know why that happens, um, but sometimes there's gaps in my rockets when we're looking at them. Anyway. So, uh, this is uh, the second stage. It burns, I think, liquid hydrogen? Yeah, um, hydrolox. Um, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And it uses the RL-10-2, RL-10-B2 engine. And uh, this is really cool because uh, it looks like a really short engine. However, if I do this when it deploys, oh shit, dog, it extends. <laughs> yeah. And it was used on the Delta III uh, cryogenic second stage. I don't know if it extends in real life. I've never seen that in a real rocket, but I guess maybe. And yeah, it's, yeah, that's pretty much all there is to say about it. Anyway, the third stage, not the third stage, the service module and the capsule. Of course, we have a, a, a launch abort system. It's slightly nicer than the one on the uh, Peg Pegasus missions. Um, it works also slightly differently. Uh, there's... So this does have a slightly lower thrust, but it also has a little less fuel, so it pulls itself away from the um, rocket uh, fairly straightly and then turns so that it doesn't just flip off the rocket. I think that's a better way of doing it. So yeah, it's pretty much the same. Um, anyway, so yes, this is of course the capsule. This actually is the Gemini capsule, just because that's my only really good two-man one. Its service module has four solar panels, just testing how, much, how many solar panels I need to keep uh, Kerbals alive. I'm not sure this will be enough, but we'll find out. Um, there's uh, the thrusters are the uh, just the standard ones we use on everything powered by hydrazine or not uh, monometal hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide I believe that is um, so not hydrazine but <laughs> these little thrusters can burn pretty much anything apparently um, it has a big battery here it has some uh, more hydrazine for its RCS thrusters these are burning hydrazine and there's some hydrazine in the pod um, but yeah that's pretty much it up here we have a docking port you can't uh, transfer crew through this but you can transfer fuel so that'll be allow us to dock and stuff and yeah, that's the uh, that's the Pegasus One mission. Let's go see it fly. So back in Florida on the pad, here we are with the f uh, Pegasus One with Jebediah and Bill in the cockpit, looking rather happy. And they will be hoisted skyward now, going towards space. Hopefully, not having to abort from the rocket. And uh, it's looking pretty good. Everything is going pretty well until I actually start to lose control of the rocket quite high in the atmosphere and you can see it starts to actually pull sideways quite seriously so we punch the abort there we go and we escape the rocket just before it disintegrates and we are safe luckily the rocket doesn't shower us with parts because uh, it kind of disintegrated laterally um, but yeah I really have to abort um, that high in the atmosphere but uh, luckily we had that abort system so yes, we land safely. The uh, Kerbals swim back to shore and are like, put me in another one, we're doing that again. So we do, and uh, we launch them like almost instantaneously after. Obviously I'm not paying attention to time because I don't have any mod that forces me to wait for launches. Um, but yeah, so now we are going to go into orbit and uh, hopefully, well, hopefully go into orbit. So uh, the launch trajectory is looking pretty good. The three engines are allowing us a great amount of control. Not massively important on this launch, but on the next launch when we try and meet this, it will be important. And we're going to eject the um, launch escape system soon because it becomes useless and an inconvenience. Uh, so there, there it goes. We do that because we need to get rid of the mass for extra delta V and also because at this point the 
um, acceleration of the first stage is so high that it's actually higher than the uh, acceleration that the launch escape system would provide the pod, so it wouldn't actually help us. And now with the second stage, we just wouldn't need it anyway because it's such a unhigh accelerating stage. Anyway, so we deploy the uh, we deploy the engine. Oh yeah, look, it extends. That's so cool. I think I showed you in the VAB, so I took the surprise out of that. But yeah, extending engine. Yeah, yeah, it's not a surprise. I shouldn't have given it away. <laughs> anyway, but no, I do really like how that engine does that. And now it's just a matter of pushing ourselves on into orbit. Quite a long burn. This isn't the highest thrust to weight ratio and um, stage in the world. It is quite small though. Um, because, well, the payload is quite small, a two-man pod isn't particularly heavy, even with the service module. Um, but it's nice to have some extra Delta V, and we will be using that second stage a little bit for um, rendezvousing with the, well, with the next capturable, because obviously this is going to be a docking mission. And uh, yeah, we're getting up to speed now, all is looking good, the Kerbal's looking happy, everyone, yeah, you're doing pretty well. I have to say, I personally wouldn't want to be in the, um, in, the gem in, in the Gemini missions. It would be cool to go to space, but... Um, the Gemini missions, some of them, including the ones that the dockings were done in, actually would be in space for like two weeks. And that's not a big pod. It's basically a seat with quite a lot of leg room, but you can't really move around at all. Like, look look around in here. Like, imagine being in that room for two weeks with a guy who hopefully you like. Um, <laughs> Because if you didn't, that would be really annoying. Uh, but I have to say, um, it would be great to go to space, but not in the Gemini capsule for two weeks. That would be just awful. I mean, they didn't even have iPads back then. What would you do? I mean, I guess you could take a book. But you couldn't take that many books. Books are freaking heavy. God, they didn't even have Kindles. J Jesus, how do they go to space? <laughs> but no, two weeks would be maddening. Um, in a Gemini capsule. But anyway, we won't be in uh, space for two weeks. So we're nice to our Kerbals. Um... But we are in space now, now we're going to deploy our power systems, which actually don't provide quite enough power, so we can only actually be in space for 18 hours. Um, yeah, yeah. The All the orbital maneuvering systems are working, but um, yeah, the power systems are a little lacking. But that's fine, we'll launch right now and catch up with, the, catch up with that rocket. And now this launch is exactly the same as before, and it goes pretty much flawlessly. So you can just see the cliff notes, here we are, decoupling the stage. And deploying the second stage engine. Oh, look at it extend. Ah, oh, it's so cool. <laughs> and then after a lot more burning and all of that kind of fun stuff, we are in orbit. There we go. Um, getting into orbit. We're going to leave ourselves quite elliptical so that we can catch up with the other spacecraft since we are behind it. So 140 kilometers is a good periapsis out of the atmosphere, but still pretty low so that we can catch up in a few orbits. Um, but before we catch up with it, we're going to need to do an inclination change, so we'll do that now. We're going to use the RCS thrusters, I believe, for eulage. Uh, oh, we've already done that. Apparently the fuel is stable. Anyway, now we're in the same plane as the Pegasus 1. This, of course, being the Pegasus 2, crewed by Valentina and Bob. Um, and now we just need to plot ourselves a uh, maneuver and see when we will be docking. Uh, we deploy our solar panels, of course, only providing us 18 hours in space, so hopefully we'll be able to rendezvous rather quickly. Um, although, actually, this electric charge doesn't deplete when we're away from the spacecraft, so it's not really a problem. But anyway, we get ourselves in our encounter after quite a lot of tweaking around. Um, it's going to be about 13 hours, so this would be within the tolerances of the mission anyway, so all is good. And, uh, yeah, we need to do this in, well, 13 hours. It's a pretty small burn on our... Um, encounter velocity isn't too high, so I think this should all go quite well. Um, I'm just, uh, yeah, tweaking the uh, radial, uh, not the radial, the normal and the prograde there to get myself a good encounter. And 13 hours later, um, everyone's getting ready. We're using the um, RCS thrusters to uh, make sure the fuel is stable. You can see there, that makes it stable. That's how to do pressurized tanks, it turns out. Um, just normal fuel tanks can be, uh, can have their fuel made stable by spinning, but these cannot. Um, as we've discovered with many failed, well, yeah, three episodes, we've already had quite a few failed missions because of that. Um, almost killed a Kerbal. Anyway, um, so now we are rendezvousing with the other spacecraft, getting in close. Um, just making sure, uh, just doing this thing where we slowly drift in, keep uh, taking off velocity and making sure we get closer and closer by burning at a certain angle so that the prograde marker is over the target marker. 
and uh, just keeping keeping our velocity as low as possible as we get closer because we don't want to smash into that spacecraft and kill all the Kerbals. We are still going very fast if this was a, a, a real encounter, um, but uh, I'm not too worried about smashing spacecraft together. You know, I, it's not like people would really die. <laughs> anyway, now I'm just orientating the um, Pegasus One to uh, get uh, to line up with the to line up its docking port with the Pegasus Two, and now we're just nulling our velocity and turning around, and now it's time to move in slowly with just thrusters, no engines, and uh, get our docking together. One meter per second would be just ridiculous in real life, but uh, yeah, I do like to do slow dockings though, um, like you see, kind of, I slow it down to like 0.1 meters per second, because you don't want your bumping, you don't want to bump spacecraft together too much. When you first stop playing, it's just whatever speed you can hit the docking port at, but eventually it's like, look how elegant. Anyway, now we're docked together, all is good. Look at those two spacecraft, and we can actually look out of the window into the other window, although we can't see the other Kerbal, so I guess they've pulled a shutter down. Maybe they don't really like us. <laughs> well, we're docked now, so there's nothing you can do. Anyway, we practice um, transferring fuel across, and uh, now we get some uh, Kerbals out. Uh, gonna get Jeb out to have a look at the spacecraft. All looking well, no damage. <laughs> the damage doesn't look so bad from out here. And then we get, oh, that was Val, actually. And then we're going to get Jebediah out. However, we do, discover, um, we do discover something rather disturbing about Jebediah. I want to go and see my reflection in Valentina's um, visor. However, Jeb doesn't have a reflection. You can see the spacecraft. You can see the thrusters on Jeb's suit. But you cannot see Jeb, which means Jeb is a vampire, which is really worrying. And also, that's Jebediah's mask. He can see the whole Earth from here, which is crazy. He's too close to see the whole Earth. How is he seeing this? I think he might have some crazy fisheye lenses in his eyes. I think he's some kind of crazy fish-eyed fucking vampire. And we've got to do something about that, man. I mean, he's a, he's a liability. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. But seriously, I, I don't know what that's about. Anyway, but now we line up for the money shot so that the press can be like, oh, look at that. And, oh, well, no one's really taking the photo, but, you know, who cares? They wouldn't see him anyway. Jeb's a fucking vampire. <laughs> anyway, then Jeb, uh, after taking posing for a shot, gets his crazy vampire self back into the capsule um, to go back to, uh, go back to Kerbin. So, uh, yeah, there we are. Well, pretty successful mission, pretty successful docking. Nice to know it's possible in real solar system. I mean, of course it was, but it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, we gotta make sure we can dock and stuff, because my moon mission will probably actually involve, um, a docking, probably kind of Apollo style. So I thought it made sense to do it sort of Gemini style to test the docking. And also there were no other two-man pods, and I didn't want to just do more one-man missions. Anyway, so we, uh, do our deorbit now. We get ourselves our periapsis over India, looks like, um, and then we're gonna... Hmm, maybe the bit next to India? Which one's that? No, I think it was India. Northern India? Yeah, yeah, anyway, it <laughs> doesn't matter. Anyway, we decouple our, um, our, our service module and we'll watch it burn up in a second as we fly over the Sahara. I think we'll see it explode just there, yeah. Um, however, when flying over the Sahara, I do notice that the Suez Canal isn't actually finished. Good job, England. Was it England who did the sewer? It was prop. We did most things. Anyway, we have bigger problems than England uh, kind of flaking on the Suez. You just saw our, um, our RCS thrusters explode, and then, and then, and then the parachutes explode. Apparently, they were too low down the spacecraft, or I just it was stupid. Uh, but the parachutes burned off. This is just a rock now. This is just a rock falling through space. Val and Bob are gonna fall just into the into the into I guess the Middle East. You know, they're gonna die. It's gonna be, it's all, oh, we lost the parachutes, <laughs> Jesus Christ! But anyway, okay, so, the, the only solution now is Kerbals are way bouncier than pods, so we're gonna have to jump out of the last second like freaking ballers, you know? Action hero, bail out, do a tuck and roll, you'll be fine, you don't need parachutes. So Bob gets out, Val jumps out, they do a sick tuck and roll, and they die, because they were falling from space. So, yeah, um... So when I bring the next Kerbals down, my plan was to shield the uh, parachutes by kind of tilting the spacecraft, enabling the weight in the spacecraft which makes it tilt this way, and hopefully two of the parachutes will be um, kind of guarded by the, uh, by, the, by the tilt of the spacecraft, and it seems to be working well. I think my theory is working out, and uh, it's looking rather good. The, par the parachutes look safe. You can see we'll probably lose one, or maybe the two on top, but we'll lose something, but hopefully we'll have a parachute to uh, to land with and they won't die and that that's the theory 
However, the atmosphere disagrees with my theory. Apparently it wasn't peer-reviewed well enough, and, uh, yeah, the parachutes burn off and shit. Well, mm. And then they hit the water just off the Middle East. But, uh, yeah, that's how you kill vampires, I guess. Just take away the parachutes. Well, that's good. We've solved the vampire problem. So let's see if we can go to the moon. I'm going to pass you over to past me, and we're going to take a look at the new vehicle. So yes, the final vehicle of today is the LF2. Kind of a mix of both of our vehicles today, actually. On top is pretty much the same probe as before for going to the uh, going to the moon, but with a few more solar panels and some RCS thrusters. And the rocket it's using is actually an extended version of the uh, Pegasus 1 rocket. I'll grab the Pegasus 1 so you can get a look at it. Um, it's just slightly bigger. Now, I was so happy with how the uh, Pegasus 1's launch vehicle performed that I thought, might as well use it for this. So you can actually see I've just extended the first stage a bit and the second stage a bit to give it enough delta V to go to the moon. Um, but other than that, it's, it's exactly the same. So, yeah. Uh, so we don't really need to look too much through that since you've just had this rocket explained to you. The probe is uh, almost the same. It obviously just has these bigger solar panels in kind of this box like this, and they extend out, and they are quite big. Um, as you can see. I'm just kind of testing, because that will definitely be enough solar power. I just want to just make sure, you know? Um, I've had a lot of power issues this episode. And there are also some hydrazine thrusters here, um, because this engine is burning hydrazine. So I brought some thrusters to provide eulage for the engines. I finally know how these work. Most um, engines which aren't highly pressurized, you can actually uh, induce eulage by rotating the stage because it provides an outward momentum and pu it pushes the fuel together basically. But apparently that doesn't work for highly pressurized engines, I don't really know why. But anyway, yes, so this is all largely the same. Let's go see it fly. This time it should definitely get to the moon. So out on the pad we're praying for success since the first mission sort of failed and the second mission succeeded kind of. Except for the whole, we lost the big four Kerbals, but yeah. Anyway, this launch is of course pretty much the same as the others today, and real solar system launches take a while, so I'm going to cut through it, uh, mostly. Deploy that cool engine! Yeah, that's a success, we just forget about the dead Kerbals. It does, you know, they knew what they were getting into when they were vampires. Anyway, we're in orbit now, and uh, now we're planning our, or our maneuver to the moon. Looks like we're going to get in nice and close, and then we'll just do a plane change and all that fun stuff. Everything should be good. The probe is well equipped, it should more than be able to get to the moon um, and hopefully even get into orbit. I do notice here, however, that the fuel's actually burning off um, because it's not in a cryogenic tank and it's liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. If you leave it for a while in the tank, it'll just start to burn off. Like my delta V starts decreasing for uh, when I'm not burning the engine because, well, the fuel burns off. It's crazy. Anyway, though, uh, we do complete the burn despite that and we still have a little bit of delta V left. Actually, 666 meters per second of delta V. What the fuck is going on? today. <laughs> There's some crazy vampiric shit going on in this space program, and I'm having none of it. So, yeah. I'll kill a million Kerbals. Oh. Anyway, yeah, you can actually see all of the rest of the fuels burned off out of that tank now, which is good, because it was, you know, number of the beast and all that shit. But, uh, yeah, so we're going to deploy the second stage now, get rid of it. Let it fly off with its, you know, seat. <laughs> and then we'll just use the service module of the uh, probe to uh, complete the burn. Um, and get ourselves into a trajectory of the moon. We, of course, use the, uh, the, the RCS thrusters to uh, induce eulage, and then fire up the uh, thrusters and get ourselves our trajectory onto the moon, and we're going to fly quite nicely around it, and we'll have enough delta V to get into some kind of orbit, which is an added bonus. So, pretty successful, it looks like it's going to be, which is good, because the other missions, uh, again, weren't super successful, but, uh, you know, they were fine. Get a nice little money shot of the moon, and then uh, fly in some more, get another money sh I This is how I get thumbnails, you know? Anyway. Um, I did notice, actually, though, on the whole subject of eulage, um, the, if you have RCS thrusters and they're turned on, and you have a unstable engine, when you hit the throttle, it'll automatically fire a quick blast of the RCS thrusters, just like that, and without you having to do anything, and the, and the fuel will be stable. So that's really cool. I just need to remember RCS thrusters on all of my spacecraft, and everything will be fine. Um, and I also need to remember to put the parachutes out of burn range. Yeah, anyway. So, so yeah, we get into orbit. Everything's good. Everything's fine. It's all... Everything... Yeah, it's a nice end to a complicated episode of Satan, vampires, and... 
to killing kerbals and eulage. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you've enjoyed it nonetheless. Hopefully the next episode will be more successful, and soon, hopefully, we will land kerbals on the moon and bring them back safely. Uh, <laughs> so yes, like I said, I hope you've enjoyed this. This has been Caspi with Tape. I will see you next time. <laughs>